Good morning, everyone. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. And we are going to start um, the lecture in just a few moments. So I encourage you to get the last of the food that is there and, uh, and to find a, find a seat quickly. And uh, I'm Dr. Lane Dennis, president and publisher of Crossway. And it is my privilege and delight to welcome you this morning um, to what has become an annual event at ETS over the last number of years. That is to sponsor an annual Crossway ETS lecture by a distinguished evangelical scholar on a topic of particular urgency for the Christian church and for the academic community. For this, the fourth annual lecture, it's our privilege and honor to have Dr. D.A. Carson uh, to speak to us on the topic of the changing, or in brackets, changeless face of evangelicalism. This is a topic of particular urgency today as some within the evangelical church and the academic community have raised the question as to whether we can even continue to use the word evangelical in a meaningful way, while others would have us retreat to an idealized reductionist concept of the evangelium that fails to embrace the, and understand the massive implications of the gospel for all of life. And while on the other hand, the secular world continues to heap atheistic disdain on the concept of God and on his people. Dr. Carson is preeminently the person to address the topic of evangelicalism. There is a sense in which the essence and implications of the evangel have been foundational to everything that Dr. Carson has taught and to everything that he has written over the last 30 plus years. Many here today have benefited in life-changing ways from his rigorous, distinguished teaching at, evangelical, at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School for more than 30 years. And many more of us from his books and lectures and preaching throughout America, North America, and around the world. Having earned his PhD in New Testament at Cambridge University, Dr. Carson brings an academic rigor and intellectual engagement to all of his work, which is well evidenced in the more than 50 books that he has written or edited. A number of these have had a decisive influence on me personally, and it is our great privilege at Crossway uh, to have published six titles uh, by Dr. Carson with another seven titles coming in the future. With this in mind, Crossway is indeed pleased to sponsor this lecture and early next year to publish the forthcoming book based on the material that you will hear today under the title of Evangelicalism, What It Is and Is It Worth Keeping? It is our prayer that the insights that Dr. Carson and, uh, articulates in this book and in his lecture here today will have a decisive impact on the future of the evangelical church for the sake of the gospel and for the glory of our Savior, for this generation and for generations to come. Not unlike the uh, influence of the Wells and Woodbridge uh, volume on evangelicalism published three de decades ago. Lastly, it is our delight to provide everyone here today with a copy of Dr. Carson's book, written and published last year as a tribute to his father, titled Memoirs of an Ordinary Pastor the life and reflections of Tom Carson. In this little book, you will encounter a humble, godly man who faithfully carried out his calling as a church planting missionary pastor in French speaking provinces of Eastern Canada, often under much opposition and persecution. And in these pages, including many excerpts from his personal journals, you will come to know an ordinary man a man who had a deep love for the Lord, for his wife, and for his flock, and because of this, left an extraordinary legacy, as evidenced in particular by his son, Dr. D.A. Carson. Please join me in welcoming Dr. D.A. Carson to speak to us today on the topic, the changing, changeless face of evangelicalism. Thank you. 
thank you so much for the warm invitation. It's been a delight to work with Dr. Lane Dennis and his staff over the last few years um, to enjoy the fellowship of professionals who are deeply committed to uh, promulgating the gospel in all of its richness. To talk about the current state of evangelicalism is certainly trendy. In the last 10 years, there have been many books and many more articles talking about what evangelicalism is, what it isn't, where it's from, where it's going, what it should be, how short-lived it now is, how it should be buried, how it may be resuscitated, and so forth. It's not very often that I am considered trendy, but here I am on a trendy subject. <laughs> to talk of the current state of evangelicalism is also risky, because on this subject, everyone has an opinion. I could talk on some esoteric matters where everybody would look at me um, fish-faced, staring blankly, and venture no opinion, but here, here, well, if I agree with you, you will think this is a terrific lecture. If I disagree with you, you'll think that I'm really up the creek. And that is part of the problem of addressing anything where people have a lot of strong feelings. It's also complicated because the definition of evangelicalism largely determines the direction of the conversation. And this definition is regularly shaped by at least three factors. Number one, the geography that defines it. Number two, the observer who defines it. And number three, the discipline that defines it. And after that, we'll consider where we should go. First, the geography that defines it. Here in the US, who calls himself an evangelical? Where does one happily use the term? In some locales, south of the Mason-Dixon line, a lot of Christians don't call themselves um, evangelicals. They call themselves Baptists with the B's, and there's no P in that word, south of the Mason-Dixon line. <laughs> in New York City, um, evangelical in the sort of elite publishing media crowd is roughly the equivalent of Protestant jihadist. I simply would not call myself an evangelical there unless I had quite a lot of time to unpack what I meant by it. It's not for nothing that we called ourselves the Gospel Coalition rather than the Evangelical Coalition. Even though, if you really come to mere lexicography, it's the same thing. Then if you step outside this country, it becomes more complicated yet. And if globalization has taught us anything, it's, it's that um, now that we're all listening in on one another and influencing one another, um, words become even more complicated. In Medellin, Colombia, for example, an evangelical is basically a non-Catholic. In Russia, the so-called evangelical Baptists have an entirely different configuration again. In Germany, you have to distinguish between evangelisch, which may have overtones of evangelical, but frequently means more or less Lutheran, and evangelical, which has overtones of sectarianism. It was a brilliant marketing coup to publish Helmut Thielicke's work as the evangelical theology. Now, in fact, it was remarkably evangelical in broad sweep, but in fact, evangelische theologie in Germany has a different overtone than what evangelical theology has here. So the geography that defines the term, even as we start addressing this subject, complicates the matter terrifically. Second, the observer who defines it. <laughs> because people know I'm writing on this subject, they, they keep handing me in interesting things or sending them to me as PDF files. Uh, this past week, I read an article by Patrol Magazine, which was one of the most blistering and uncouth descriptions of evangelicalism. Um, they won't get over it, it's called. 
it's all these stupid evangelicals who should just stop trying to defend this massive thing that is dying. It's, it's already a dead horse. Stop flogging it and uh, g get on with life. Uh, except that the language chosen was more colorful. Uh, and, and, and obviously, th this is from a group that has, in fact, some evangelical roots, um, but, but now the tone of dismissal is, is not only angry, it's condescending and sneering. But even amongst professionals, because we are so often taught in our doing history, in our doing sociology and so on, to speak of the object studied as them, then evangelicals are the them that we're studying, even if then in a footnote somewhere, because we all have to acknowledge where we come from, we acknowledge that we, we too are evangelical. It's, it's, it's a, a kind of self-distancing. Whereas if, in fact, the evangelical movement ought to be about the evangel, then on the one hand, you do want to talk about our sins collectively with Isaiah. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst a people of unclean lips. But you also want to talk about our commitment to the evangel and not always speak of the movement in, 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 in the, the second person or the third person. So the observer who defines it affects this discussion. But most importantly, the discipline that defines it is uh, exerting enormous influence in contemporary discussion. First, the social sciences. This can be done at the popular level with uh, a polling group like Barna or the Pew group or Gallup. And then every once in a while there is some sort of research published in which it is shown, for instance, that in terms of mores, those who call themselves evangelical have the same divorce rates as the broader population. Yes, what does that mean? That already presupposes, you see, that somebody has ticked a box saying, I am an evangelical, I am not an evangelical. Does that define what evangelicalism is? Moreover, it has also been shown that when you run the same sort of sequence, but throw in a few extra filters, are you an evangelical who, tick the box, attends church at least once a week, number two, reads his or her Bible daily, number three, prays daily. You, you put in those filters, and that group's mores profile is very different from the broader one. So where are the evangelicals? Is it defined by performance? By attending church? By praying daily? Is it merely defined by self-identification? Then sometimes we define evangelicalism from the discipline of history. When did evangelicalism begin? At the Reformation? in the 18th century with the great evangelical awakening, in the 19th century, in its modern metamorphosis in the U.S., in the 20th century, we speak constantly of the resurgence of the evangelicalism under Carla F. H. Henry and Billy Graham and, and so forth, or in the first century. Oh no, you can't do that because there was not a movement that called itself evangelicalism in the first century. And suddenly you realize that the, the subject matter is difficult if you are using the historian's labels to talk about movements. I suppose amongst historians, the most frequently cited approach is that of Bebbington, who speaks of a quadrilateral of priorities that is the basis of evangelicalism, conversionism, activism, Biblicism and Cruci-centrism. Now, this is uh, widely cited, but there have also been some pretty stinging criticisms of this approach. For a start, each of these isms is remarkably flaccid. It can be taken in a strong sense and a weak sense. What does Biblicism mean? What does Cruci-centrism mean? mean. You could argue that devout Orthodox Catholics are as cruci-centric as 
evangelicals are. So the labels are a bit weak. And moreover, there is no sense of heritage uh, connected with the solas of the Reformation, for, for example. In one analysis that came out of a scholar in Canada who was analyzing Catholicism in the province of Quebec, where I grew up, uh, his analysis was that using Bebbington's quadrilateral, approximately 30% of French-speaking Catholics um, are in fact evangelical. Um, I suspect he hasn't planted a church there recently. The, 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 the definitions have become so flaccid that, um, that uh, a merely historical approach is problematic, even though it's useful on all kinds of grounds. How about a theological definition of evangelicalism? Evangelicalism is that movement dominantly shaped by adhering to the evangel, to the gospel. Well, I shall argue shortly that it is the best sort of approach, but it must not be an exclusive approach. There is a place for understanding ourselves demographically and for understanding ourselves historically as well. But in my view, this approach must take a certain precedence. Yet this in turn raises the question, what then is the evangel? What is the gospel? It merely pushes questions of definition one step farther back. But at least here we can turn to Scripture and argue it out. We may usefully begin as many have done, as John Stott has done, with a passage like 1 Corinthians 15. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise you have believed in vain. And then as you work through the following verses, you cannot help but note that the gospel is Christological. It's about Christ Jesus. It's about the cross. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. It's grounded in the resurrection. It's apostolic. It is bound up with the witnesses of the first generation and their authority. It is life transforming. It is something to be proclaimed. It is in its essence news about what God has done to redeem us. It issues in the chapter ultimately in the, in the triumph of resurrection existence in the new heaven and the new earth and so forth. Recently for another publication that is not yet out, I studied afresh every instance of euangelion, not only in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament and the surrounding Greco-Roman world, to find out what euangelion would mean in the first century. And amongst the things that you discover when you look at that word and its cognates, it is bound up with news. News. News that is usually good news, but it's in any case big news. It's terrific news. So when one finds definitions of the following sort, one is troubled. Here, for example, was a group of um, students uh, under the leadership of a godly evangelical faculty member who came up with this definition. The gospel. God's gracious invitation to join with people from all over the world in being rescued from sin through faith in Jesus Christ and remade through the power of God's Spirit into those who bring glory to God and bring blessing to the world. Good? Bad? It's hit quite a number of the cliches that we can all stand up and applaud. But it is shockingly bad. It's bad in the first instance because it begins by saying it's God's invitation. No, the invitation flows out from the news itself. But the news is first of all what God has done. And second, it's managed to talk about being rescued from sin through faith in Jesus Christ without even talking about the cross or the resurrection. This feels very different from 1 Corinthians 15. It's not that there's anything here that is heretical. It's merely not well-centered. And I'm afraid I have a long list of such things that have come from very reputable sources that are deeply troubling. <laughs> 
Still, the advantage of this approach of trying to sort out what the gospel is, what the evangel is, in order to sort out what evangelicalism should be, is that it does justice to what in the past has been called the formal principle and the material principle. The formal principle is the principle of authority that stands behind our understanding of the gospel. It is, for us, sola scriptura. That is to say, at the end of the day, we base ourselves on the exclusive authority of God disclosing himself in Holy Scripture. And on the material principle, as everyone in this room will know, originally the Evangelical Theological Society uh, opted for a statement of faith that founded itself purely on the formal principle. That, I think we all recognize now, was a mistake. Because after all, Jehovah's Witnesses and many other groups have similar formal principles. By itself, the formal principle does not establish how we read anything in this revelation, which is why our forebears thought through not only the formal principle, but also the material principle. And the material principle is simply what the gospel is. Do we have a common understanding of what that gospel is as articulated uh, in the, 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 the Holy Scriptures? Now, <clears throat> having said that a theological approach to the definition of evangelicalism by defining, first of all, what the evangel is takes precedence, I still want to argue that there are some weaknesses to, uh, dare I say it, merely theological definition of evangelicalism. Number one, we cannot ignore how this gospel has worked out in history. We simply cannot. And as soon as we do this, we immediately have to recognize that there are some groups today that are evangelical theologically who never call themselves that. For example, there are um, strands of confessional Lutheranism, for example, where no one calls himself or herself uh, an evangelical. I'm a Lutheran, but nevertheless, theologically, they're evangelicals. And likewise, there are many who call themselves evangelicals who have abandoned either the formal or the material principle. That is, sociologically, they do belong to a certain kind of club called evangelical, but that does not mean that they hold to any of its historic distinctives or still less to biblically defined priorities. So one has to ask oneself, when the term evangelicalism is being thrown around, one has to ask oneself, um, out of what matrix is this definition being given before one can have an intelligent conversation? So in that sense, I want to argue that there were evangelicals in the first century. Now, that sounds ridiculous from the point of view of an historian, but if evangelicalism is defined with respect to its uh, understanding of the evangel, to its understanding of its formal principle, then evangelicalism at its best ought to be nothing other than biblically faithful Christianity. That is so sweeping, but yet, but yet it is fundamental. And in this case, likewise, when we return to the great creeds of the church, for example, that is part of our heritage. When we turn to the Reformation and work through the solas, it's because we are convinced the solas articulate something that is foundational to a faithful understanding of what the gospel is. But then also, we inevitably bump up against movements like the Evangelical Awakening. One of the dangers of a purely theological definition of evangelicalism is precisely that it sounds too much like an ism. Ah, you know me well enough to know that I'm not going to downplay the importance of theology. Yet at the same time, it is quite possible to be an evangelical confessionally and not to be reborn. 
It is possible to be an evangelical in terms of adhering to the formal principle and the material principle and, and never ever to have been transformed by the grace of God. In fact, Ian Murray argues that the second great awakening was largely a movement of God to convert many, many people who were entirely orthodox in their belief structures but who had sunk into some form of nominalism. In other words, while we defend forensic justification and while we insist on the solas of the Reformation, we must also insist you must be born again. Now obviously to preach the new birth without having an understanding of what was secured by the cross, what was achieved by the cross, and how this plays out is itself going to lead eventually to mere experientialism. But to have a well-articulated doctrine of the atonement and not to see how we must be born again is itself finally death-dealing. One remembers the quip of George Whitfield when he was asked why he preached again and again and again and again from John 3, you must be born again. All the time, you must be born again. You must be born again. Why? Why? Because, Whitfield said, you must be born again. <laughs> and, and thus when I hear criticisms from some branches that rightly place a lot of emphasis on the priority of the local church, here, here, I say, but so understand this priority of the local church that for children growing up in the bosom of the church, we have the right to assume regeneration, a presumptive regeneration. I confess, I smell the beginnings of death. For around the corner, within 50 to 100 years, history has shown again and again that the failure to re-evangelize the next generation under the rubric of presumptive regeneration leads eventually to a catastrophic decline. Witness the white churches of South Africa, witness Holland and many other exa exemplars. In other words, a theological approach can sound simply too exclusively intellectual it fails to recognize how the gospel properly understood in scripture is not only cruciocentric, after which we may speak of cruciocentrism, another ism, it is also the power of God unto salvation to those who believe. Where is the power? So the weaknesses of a purely theological definition, it seems to me, are manifold even if we grant a certain primacy to this sort of approach. So let me be so bold as to suggest steps ahead. Number one, think hard about the gospel. Think hard about the evangel. It has become quite common in recent years to think of the gospel along some such biblical storyline as the following. In the beginning, God made everything good. But in our sin, in our rebellion, in this catastrophic fall, we set out to destroy everything. We destroyed our relationships with one another. We destroyed our relationship with God. We destroyed our relationship with this world. And the sad record of human history is one of decay and destruction. H however much there are signs of grace here and there, everything from rape to genocide, from exploiting the planet to our marital breakdowns, it's all the result of this horrible rebellion. 
But God, in his mercy, he set out to save his cursed image bearers. He did this in a variety of ways. He called out Abraham from Ur of the Chaldees and set up a whole new humanity. He gave the law, which itself was a gracious and good gift. And then by institutions, the sacrificial system, by words, the prophets, by instruction, by, by the modeling of, of, of a Davidic king, by the institutions of the tabernacle and the priesthood, we, we were shown how God was, was in due course coming to triumph over all of our failure and decay. The prophets spoke of one who was to come, and in the fullness of time, God sent his son, a first century Jew, legally in the line of David. And he not only taught, but he, he broke out the kingdom. He, he displayed kingdom authority, the kingdom of God itself, inaugurated already in miracles and in signs, in, in the unraveling of evil. And finally, in the destruction of death itself, death winds backward. He rose from the dead in anticipation of the great resurrection to come. And we are invited to participate in this kingdom proclamation, this kingdom living. We, we are commanded to do so. And, and we push back, by God's grace, the frontiers of darkness and decay everywhere in anticipation of the time when God himself brings in the end a new heaven and a new earth, a home of righteousness, resurrection existence. Yes, come, Lord Jesus. What's missing? You see, this is a very common way of, of outlining the gospel today. What's missing? You see, nothing I have said is untrue. What's missing? What, what, what is missing is any recognition that bound up with our rebellion and decay, at the center of our rebellion and decay, is such ugly, heinous defiance of God himself that God stands over against us not only in love, but also in holy wrath. Six hundred times the Bible speaks of the wrath of God. And this wrath of God is displayed preeminently in the Old Testament, not against human beings because they are unjust to their slaves, although it can't speak in such terms, but preeminently because of our idolatry. It's the de-godding of God. Such that finally you cannot understand the mystery and the glory of the gospel, of the gospel of the cross, of the gospel of the kingdom, unless you see that its first business is announcing the good news of what God has done in Christ Jesus on the cross and in the resurrection to reconcile his rebellious image bearers to himself. It's not first of all to, to bring them to some kind of mutual recognition of their horizontal sins, but rather it is to reconcile men and women to God. What is the gospel? Think hard about the gospel. Number two, never assume the gospel. Proclaim it. Never assume the gospel. Proclaim it. I've been teaching now for 30 plus years, and I've often said that if I have learned anything from all of these years of teaching, it's that my students don't learn everything I teach. <laughs> what they tend to learn is what I emphasize, what I'm excited about. The danger of many courses in seminaries, the danger of many sermons preached, is that we assume the gospel and then focus on what flows from the gospel. That is a mistake. Preach the gospel. If I assume the gospel, believing it with all my heart to be central, but that is not where I fasten my attention. 
then my students are simply not excited about the gospel. And their students won't even know what it is. The gospel is best preserved not by arguing about it, though we need to argue about it to make sure that we sharpen one another and understand what the scripture actually says and be mutually corrected, but it is best preserved not by arguing about it, but by proclaiming it. So that those of us especially who teach, as I do, in an evangelical institution, we can live our whole lives with fellow believers in churches, with seminary students and the like, and, and somehow not see or feel the urgency of gospel proclamation. You and I especially, we must put ourselves in positions where we ourselves are articulating the gospel to fellow believers and to outsiders. We must be doing evangelism. I came back two or three weeks ago from a place I will mention in the Gulf. And in the Muslim world, to find this new generation of Christians with almost a first century passion for the gospel, knowing what it could cost them, reminds us once more that this gospel is desperately precious. And it is best honored by the cognate verb not just the euangelion, but what we must do is announce this good news, euangelizomai con and uh, cognates. Number three, trust this gospel. Trust this gospel. I, I am interested in understanding the social demographic profiles of the particular part of the world where I am currently ministering. That's part of our responsibility. We see it in the Apostle Paul who, who learns how to preach in Athens to complete pagans and who preaches in synagogues in Acts 13. He, he understands that you, you have to, uh, to, to grasp the profile, the, the levels of understanding, the commitments, the, the, the signals that are bound up with the particular group to which you are speaking. Fair enough. But the danger of taking endless courses on the profiles of people to whom you are speaking is that you begin to think that if you understand the profile well enough, you will be successful. Now, if you don't understand the profile at all, you may, in fact, be scratching where nobody's itching. You may guarantee a certain blindness, a certain kind of deafness, because you are not able to communicate very well. But just because you do understand the profile does not mean that you are articulating the gospel. You may begin to trust your analysis of the profile rather than the gospel itself. What is essential is such a confidence in the gospel as the power of God to salvation that for all that we try hard to understand the people to whom we are speaking and to take away with compassion and understanding the blinders and the barriers that may be put up. Here someone like Tim Keller is a marvelous example. Yet at the end of the day, it's the gospel itself that transforms. Now in this age of spectacular technology and many possibilities of innovation, it, it is so easy to begin to trust our multi-site electronic world, which is not saying something either for or against multi-sites. It's merely saying that cannot be seen as the fundamental cause of genuine evangelical growth. It is the articulation, the proclamation of the gospel. I have a daughter, she's 27, and occasionally now she sends me something that she's picked up on the web somewhere, thinks that I might be interested. This past week, she sent me an article on new digital churches where it's not a matter of going to a place in the real world, the non-digital world, and having digital forms of communication on every side, but you go to digital church without ever leaving your bedroom, so long as you've got a laptop with a good internet connection. And when you enter this digital church, then there are greeters to meet you. 
and you're handed a kind of electronic digital bulletin and you might go to a small group and you get some training, you go to a, a, a big service and, 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 and there there is really loud music that's pummeled through where you can join in or not, probably not if you're in your bedroom in your pajamas, but, but there, there, there it is, you can join in the corporate uh, singing if you wish. And you, there's even a taking up of the offering. It, you, you know, you, you can do it by credit card. Uh, uh, and, 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 and this is, is reaching a whole new generation. It, th this is the digital world. What I loved about it when my daughter sent it to me was that she prefaced it with the little note, how sad is that? <laughs> I have to tell you, I wrote back and said it's the perfect expression of evangelicalism, of evangelical solipsism and narcissism. She wrote back, solipsism, awesome word. I think you might be the only person who sends his daughter emails that require the use of a dictionary. <laughs> so I wrote back, and you're one of the few 20-somethings who's still excited about needing a dictionary to enjoy the pleasure of learning new, le new words. <laughs> but but isn't, isn't this something that we want to think through? For all that we want to uh, absorb and use useful technology, at the end of the day, it is the gospel that is life transforming. And the gospel has certain things to say also about how we live and work and serve together, how we love each other. Uh, the, the, the gospel, as it is announced, produces certain kinds of effects. While we announce the gospel, we also teach what the Bible says are the effects of the gospel. And that has to do with how we understand what the local church is and how it works and how Christians love one another. And that brings me to a further reflection. The gospel in the New Testament is the big category. It's not the small category. There is a brand of putative gospel faithfulness in which the gospel is seen as that message from God by which we're tipped into the kingdom. That's the small bit. That's when you raise a hand or make a decision or sign a piece of paper, all of which may be good things to do depending on a lot of factors. But at the end of the day, the real business of discipleship, the real business of transformation, the real business of sanctification, the real business of growing conformity to Christ, that takes place after the gospel. So the gospel is the small category, and after that comes all of the discipleship business. And that surely must occupy 90% of our time. But work through the biblical uses, uses of um, euangelion, and you discover very quickly that gospel is the big category. It is the big category under which we put our discipleship. It is the big category under which confessing the lordship of Jesus makes sense, uh, uh, under, which, under which there is transforming power in social relationships. L let me give you one small example. If you hold the small view of the gospel, and you do understand that Christ died on the cross and bore our sins in his own body on the tree, and God's justice is satisfied, you understand these things, but you still have this smaller view of the gospel, then you are interested in people being justified by grace alone through faith alone, but then even you may think that after that all of the work of transformation and discipleship building takes place with this justification in the background, now merely assumed. But justification has huge implications for how you live. What is the opposite of justification? Non-justification? Pastorally, the opposite of justification is self-justification. Over against being justified by someone outside ourselves, being justified by God 
through what he has done in Christ, we justify ourselves. So that the man, for example, who approaches Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Once Jesus gives him the first round of responses, he asks another question. Luke's comment is, he, wanting to justify himself, said. And then a few chapters farther on, further people approaching Jesus, wanting to justify themselves. Or the parable of the Pharisee and the publican going up to the temple together. The, 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 the Pharisee saying, I thank you, God, that I am not as other men are, including this wretched publican over here. What is that but self-justification? So now you have come out of a really rotten background where you never could gain enough of your parents' approval. They were just so harsh and miserable all the time. And now you've become a Christian, and you know that you're justified before God. What is it in you then? What is it in you that is constantly trying to show yourself good enough to be accepted by others, to be loved by church people, to be accepted by your siblings? Isn't that a form of self-justification that is denying the justification that you have experienced in the onset of the gospel? There is so much of Christian discipleship and growth that is bound up with the cross work in justification. What sins do we commit where we are not tripping over self-justification? Self-justification in our publications, in our schools, how our spouses think of us, how we think about ourselves. Self-justification. Even though at some level we know that we've been justified by another. If the gospel is rightly understood, if the gospel is rightly conceived, the glory of being justified by God himself through what he has provided in his son, by grace alone, through faith alone, begins to transform all of our relationships. In one sense, sanctification, understood in the reform sense, not always in the Pauline sense, sanctification is nothing other than the progressive application of justification. That's too easy, but there's some truth to it. And you can show by working hard at a study of the gospel that, that the gospel is the big category that transforms absolutely everything. So that salvation, in all of its comprehensiveness, yes, it, it does ultimately issue in resurrection existence in a new heaven and a new earth, but it comes back to a center that is tightly Christological, cross-orientated, bound up with the triumph of the resurrection, and everything flows out of this. In short, Evangelicalism cannot be saved and should not be saved by promoting it. Evangelicalism can be saved only by promoting the evangel, by understanding it, by teaching it, by believing it, by proclaiming it. Whether there is a certain ism with evangelical in front of it that is progressing or not, sociologically defined, is of relatively little importance. So I would not want you to think that I am spending much time defending a word. But insofar as evangelicalism is tied to the evangel, the gospel once for all delivered to the saints, but manifested in many different cultures, in many different languages, in many different places, in many different times, still identifiably connected with that which was once for all delivered to the saints. That is worth promoting, and the result will be a robust evangelicalism, whether it is called that or not. And that is worth living for and dying for.
Let me venture one final step. My wife and I are in some ways um, opposites. She is constantly saying things like, this time last week we, whatever, or this time last year we, and, and is all cooey and happy about remembering what took place last week, last year. And I have learned, after all, I've been married 34 years, I have learned to say, oh yes, wasn't that wonderful? I barely remember it. <laughs> I'm just the opposite. I'm always thinking three stages down the road. I'm thinking of what I'm doing next week and next month and next year. That's just the way I'm wired. I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm just saying we complement each other quite nicely. We sort of cover the field this way. <laughs> but also, when we face something or other, she immediately thinks glass half empty. I immediately think glass half full. That's just the way we are. And probably between us, we get that one pretty right, too. But I'm, remember, I re, I'm reminded of what Tim Keller says in this respect. Christians, he says, will not be optimists. How can we be? We know about the fall and its entailments. And Christians cannot be pessimists. Optimism is naive, he says. Pessimism is atheistic. As I look around at the movement broadly called evangelicalism today, then I observe many, many commentators who talk about the weaknesses and the failures and the inconsistencies and the shamefulness and the decay and so on. And by and large, they're right. And my wife says, Amen. We certainly need those warnings. But I don't think I'm the only one who also senses today a time of refreshment that has huge potential. I've been teaching students now for a long time, and, and with you, I have observed generations that are interested in this particularity or that particularity. Some come through, and everybody's talking about the Toronto blessing, and then another generation comes through, and they're all talking about uh, eschatology, and then another generation comes through, and they're all talking about you name it. I've seen them all, except this generation. This is the best generation I've ever taught. I, I don't mean that they're the brightest, although some of them are very gifted. I mean in terms of seriousness, wanting to handle the Bible well, wanting to be mentored by old people like me. This is a great time to be 60-something, let me tell you. This is a new generation that's coming along and wanting to get things right and to be faithful. I have more people in my st uh, spiritual formation group, in my small group, who are asking, probing questions about planting churches in inner cities than I've ever had. And it's not just me, and it's not just Trinity. As I look around, I'm seeing this taking place not only in many, many other seminaries and Bible colleges, I'm observing it in other parts of the world too. I don't know what it means. I'm, I'm the last person to want to say this is, uh, this is a mark of, of, of impending um, revival. I, I don't know that. But I have to tell you, I'm encouraged. This is not a time for a lot of bad-mouthing. This is a time for a re-articulation of the gospel and implanting this gospel in the lives of a new generation coming along who are going to be seeing the fruit of what you and I do now in decades long after we have gone to glory. This is a time for saying, yes, Lord Jesus, this is a cloud the size of a man's hand on the horizon, but bring it on, bring it on. What you have done in the past, do it again. Look at Europe, Heavenly Father. You have used this place in the past, but is Europe too hard for you? C -c -c -can, can you not bring about in Europe what you have been bringing about in China? I is Europe so sophisticated that you cannot break through? Will you not get glory for yourself there too? And here in our churches, in our schools, in our lives, in our homes, what we want above all is this gospel passed on from generation to generation, precisely through such teachers as you and I are, through preachers all around this land and around the world,
let evangelicalism look after itself, provided we be faithful to the evangel and to the Lord of this evangel. Let us pray. We confess, Lord God, how easily distracted we are by the pressures of the urgent, one more set of papers, one more committee meeting. We confess how easily distracted we are by things that are important, but in comparison to the gospel, relatively peripheral. We want to be holistic, Lord God, since you are Lord of all. We do not want to be reductionistic and focusing on the gospel in some narrow sense that forgets the world around us, brothers and sisters in need, hurting people. What we want, Lord God, is to have eyes to see and wills to believe and obey this holistic gospel, once for all delivered to the saints, and of which we are the bearers in your providence in our generation. O oh Lord God, we beg of you, make us faithful, make us eager for the glory of your dear Son. Grant us a passion to see not only ourselves, but men and women everywhere transformed by this life-giving gospel. Have mercy on us, we pray, as we look afresh to you, our sovereign, our providential Lord, our final judge, and to your dear Son, who himself promised, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Yes, yes, even so, come, Lord Jesus. In whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Don, for challenging us and bringing us back to the foundational reality of everything in the gospel and Christ and his death and re resurrection. And um, I would encourage you um, to visit uh, the Gospel Coalition website and to follow the work um, that is being done there, a tremendous asset in building up the body of Christ. And I'd encourage you all um, in rooting everything that you do in this massive reality of the gospel and who Christ is and what he has done on our behalf. Um, I'm just going to uh, close again in prayer and, uh, and commit Don and his work um, to the Lord, but all of us here together um, under our sovereign Lord and his gracious provision for all things. So let's bow in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we bow before you as our sovereign and loving Lord and as the one apart from whom we can do nothing. And we thank you for this uh, timely and foundational and essential reminder in bringing us back to the cross and to Christ and to the gospel that you have entrusted to us to proclaim faithfully. And we <clears throat> pray for the signs that we have seen, that uh, little cloud on the horizon the size of a fist, and that um, that, that would come and bear uh, fruit and rain and water the soil and that you in your power and your spirit uh, would unfold a massive worldwide revival of being born again and transformed by the gospel and living that out in every aspect of life. So we come to you and we bow before you as our sovereign and loving Lord and as the Lord of all creation and, and as the one who has given us Christ as our Savior. And may everything we do be done for your glory and be rooted in the gospel. And so we give you the praise and the honor and the glory in all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>
thank you all for coming today. God bless you.